Uh, Heavenly Father and King of Glory, we come here to adore you this uh, afternoon. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and love. And thank you, Lord, for these, your sons and daughters that have gathered this afternoon. We give glory to the Lord for each one of them. And we pray that, Lord, as we share in your word, that our hearts will be edified and your name will be glorified. We give you thanks in Jesus Christ we have prayed. Amen. I want to join my sister Rona to welcome all of you to this afternoon service. Some of us do not have the grace of the afternoon. We have the grace of waking up early <laughs> into church, but we thank God for each one of you because each one of us, the Lord has given them grace differently. So we thank the Lord for today, and we're going to be talking about pro proportionate giving, and the subject of giving was introduced last week, and we do this at least once, um, one month in a year. We remind ourselves that we need to give back to the Lord out of that which he has given us. And so I'm going to be sharing a few principles of giving, and then after that I'll dwell more on the principle of proportionate giving. Giving is something that we have grown up doing. It's giving is something that our parents have done to us and we have done to them. And it is something that we have done with friends. We give to each other. We walk to each other's parties and we are able to take a gift to each other. And so we realize that in that, there is one thing that is very unique. It is relationships. Giving cannot happen without a relationship. There has to be a relationship so that you can be able to give to each other. So one of the principles of giving is that giving is a priority. It has to be a priority because when you're thinking about giving back to the Lord, you have to make it priority in your life. You have to make it something that you are saying, you know what, I must give back to God. It is priority. And when you read in the Old Testament, it was priority, especially the scripture that was shared last Sunday in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, which talks about giving of the first fruits. It was priority for the children of Israel to make sure that the first fruits out of everything that they have received must be taken to the house of the Lord. And it was so there in intention to give to the Lord, it was just very clear because the Lord had told them uh, to do so. And so they did it as a command and a response to what God had told them to do. Secondly, giving is sacrificial. Giving is sacrificial. If you do not know how to sacrifice a bit of yourself and give it away, you will never be a giver. And many of us have failed to give because I feel like everything around me is mine. You want to receive, but you do not want to give. And therefore, you, every time your hands are open, but your hands are closed when it comes to terms of giving. Giving is sacrificial. David understood this very well when he said in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24, for him he said that, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my burnt offerings that cost him. He was like, I must be able to give something. So there are, there are things that you really need to think about in your life, especially when it comes to giving back to the Lord. You know, um, we look at ourselves, some of us have started working, some of us are not working, some of us are still earning from parents, but it still comes back to you that whatever that you have, you must have a portion to share with the Lord. But then thirdly, that giving has to... So giving has to be done carefully. Second Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7 tells us that each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver giver. So there are things that you need to know if you are going to be a giver. And you know, giving starts by giving to God. That's when you learn how to give to one another. So you give, but you give with a cheerful heart. 
You know, when you do not give with a cheerful heart, you give with a grudging heart. You give with a grumbling heart. And we want to assure you that if your heart is grumbling and you're not happy about what you're doing, just do not do it. Because it's not pleasing to the Lord. You can only do it if your heart is released to do it. And the Bible is saying that each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart. Which means you have a moment to agree with God and yourself. You look at what you have and you're saying, God, out of what I have, a portion of it, I'm going to give it to the Lord. There is giving to everybody, but here we are talking specifically about giving to the Lord. And not just giving the way we do to friends. That one is an obligation. You have a friend, you have to give. You have family, you have to give. You have other people, you have to give. But here we are talking about giving back to God. You must give out of a cheerful heart, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's not reluctantly, it's not under compulsion. It's not where they tell you, please get out whatever that you have and give it now. And then you give it, you have no food, you have no school fees, you have no whatever. No, that is not giving to the Lord. Giving to the Lord is not under compulsion. And so when we talk about giving, there are principles that we need to have as our children of God to know that if I'm going to be a giver, then there are certain things that I need to know. And when you talk about sacrificial giving, you are being reminded about the sacrifice that God offered for offering Jesus Christ as his only son and sacrificially giving him to us as a sacrifice, as an atonement for our sin. When he did not even have to do it, but he did it and he gave wholeheartedly. So giving begins with that sacrificial life that you must offer yourself to the Lord holy. And without offering yourself to the Lord holy, giving is going to be a problem. And we pray that God will teach us how to give back to him. Then finally, giving has to be done proportionately. Giving has to be done proportionately. When you read Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, it's a familiar verse where God was telling the children of Israel to bring the whole tithe in his storehouse, that there will be food in his house. And he's saying, test me. You know, when you look at this scripture, it's a very good example of proportionate giving. That God is asking the children of Israel that just get a tenth of what you have and give to me. The rest belongs to you. Actually, when we talk about a tithe today, it's like what I earn per month is what I get and give back to the Lord. For the Jews, it was not just a tithe, a, a simple tithe like a one-off. There was a temple tithe, there was a tithe for the, for the Levites, there was a tithe. So there were quite a number of them. And so they gave so much more than what we give today. But the Lord is conditioning us and he's reminding us that out of the 100% that you have, you only have to give back to God a tenth of what you have. That is proportionate giving. A portion of what you have, you give it back to the Lord. And when you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, he mentions that again, he says, on the first day of the week, each of you is to set something aside and save in keeping with how he is prospering so that no collections will be made when I come. What Paul is literally saying is saying every other time you need to set aside something for the Lord, which means giving is intentional. How much do you keep for yourself and how much do you set aside to say what I have? Yes, this is mine, but for this one, I am setting aside for the Lord. It is not mine. I cannot touch it. It is for the Lord. It is for the work of the Lord. I can only use it for the work of the Lord. It is not mine. I pray that the Lord will give us the grace to be intentional in our giving. Our giving must be intentional. And it does not come when you have started earning a lot of money. Giving starts when you are a little child. When you are young, you begin to learn the spirit of giving. So that by the time 
you reach your youth, you reach your marriage, you know that I've actually grown up in a culture of giving back to the Lord. Uh, I've been excited about a number of youth that have walked to my office and they have said, this is my first fruit. I have received this job. I prayed from the Lord and now the Lord has given to me. I have brought back to the Lord. And we pray for them and we bless them and ask that the Lord will prosper them. But the first thing they think about is bringing back to the house of the Lord as a great thanksgiving for what the Lord has done for them. So giving is about a kingdom. It's about worship. It's about a trust to the God that you serve. It is about knowing that actually what I have does not belong to me. Giving must be intentional and giving must be consistent. For the children of Israel, there was nothing like a bargaining about giving. God had commanded and that is exactly what the children of Israel did in honor of who God is. Giving is acknowledging that God is sovereign over everything that I have. Whatever that I have is not mine. It all belongs to the Lord. And once you understand that all that you are and all that you have belongs to the Lord, then giving becomes easier because you know I am giving to a God whom I have a relationship with. And my prayer is that God himself will teach us what it takes to give back to him. When you look back in the scripture that we have just read in um, Deuteronomy chapter 17, you realize that beginning from the first verse, it is a, God is telling them about what is going to be happening when they reach the promised land. And they had been going through these feasts and celebrations. And one of them, they are talking about the Passover, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Booths, or the Tabernacle Feast. Or, and all these feasts used to happen as a reminder for the children of Israel to remember where God had brought them from. Because these feasts started happening, the Passover feast started happening when they were moving from Egypt to start their journey to the promised land. They had the Passover, and therefore God is reminding them that when you settle in the promised land, you are going to keep the feasts. But when you keep these feasts, this is what is going to happen. And so he's giving them instructions. When you look at the Feast of Booths or the Feast of the Tabernacles, it was just to um, remind them about their connectedness with God. They were supposed to celebrate this feast because they were so connected with God. While they were in the wilderness, they could not set up a temple for worship, but they had the temporary structures. They had the tents for worship. And therefore, God is reminding them that sometime later, when they reach the promised land, they are going to pitch up these tents as a reminder. Now that they had the temple, but there was a way in which they needed to remind themselves about the journey that they walked from the wilderness into the promised land. And therefore it was a time of celebration, it was a time of spiritual purification that their hearts were renewed and revived as they celebrated this feast. It was a time of overwhelming joy. So they gathered together overwhelmingly, there was a lot of rejoicing, there was a lot of uh, thanksgiving for God's miraculous protection and all the feasts had to make them to remain Remember that God has been faithful in our journey and this far he has brought us. And when you look at verse 12 of chapter 16, he says, You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. So they had to remember what God had done for them. Friends, the children of Israel moved from, the, from Egypt through the promised land. And many of times when we get into challenges, that is when we remember, God, you led the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea. Please read me through to cross this Red Sea. But when you are at peace, you never remember that there are challenges that you are going to go through. 
But God is reminding the children of Israel that when you reach the promised land, you need to remember. And you are going to remember by going through all these feasts and celebrating. Why don't we celebrate this today? We do not celebrate this today because Christ has become our greatest celebration now. And so when we join it together on a Sunday, it is a great feast of celebration. We come on a Sunday service like this to tell ourselves that God has done great things. And therefore, on a Sunday, I rise up, I go to church and celebrate the goodness of the Lord. As we join it together in this celebration, it is a feast to remind us about what God has done in our lives. It is a feast to remind us about the journey that we have walked through the week. And now we join it together to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. Just as the children of Israel joined together and celebrated, we join it together in the celebration on a Sunday to remember what God has done in our lives. It is a weekly celebration. Remember for the children of Israel, it was a time when they had to move to Jerusalem. We no longer have to move that far, but we can come so near at All Saints Cathedral, in the cathedral here, to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. To celebrate what the Lord has done. To celebrate the hassles, the hurdles that the Lord has taken us through. To celebrate the pains that we have gone through. But also to celebrate the achievements that the Lord has made in our lives. And through that, the Lord is saying, when you get to those days, when you remember, when you celebrate because you remember me, I will bless you. Praise the Lord. The Lord is saying he will bless the children of Israel. And he says in verse 15 that for 70 days you shall keep the feast to the Lord your God at the place that the Lord will choose because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you'll be altogether joyful. The Lord reminded the children of Israel that if they keep the feast, he's going to bless them. If they keep the feast, if they keep celebrating, if they keep remembering his goodness, if they keep remembering that he's God who is sovereign over all, if they keep remembering that it is God who has led them where they are, then God will keep blessing them and he will bless the fruit of their land and he will bless them in all ways. And he says, all together, I will give you joy. Dear friends, when we talk about celebrating and being joyful before the Lord, we know that we are now living in a world where people have lost their joy because of the things that are happening around them. But the Lord is reminding us that remember to celebrate. And he's saying, come together with all your families. When you read verse 14, it is not just one person, but coming together. So when we come together to celebrate in a time like this, we come together as a command from the Lord that the Lord has conditioned us to come together to celebrate his faithfulness and his love. And it is out of that when we remember together what the Lord has done for us, that we are saying, God, we come with hearts that are open, we come with hearts that are full of gratitude, and when it comes to the time of giving, then we are able to give back to the Lord because our hearts have already been released to the Lord, and we are coming with joy and celebration. And that is why when you read verses 16, he says, Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that you will choose, at the feast of unleavened bread, at the feast of weeks, at the feast of booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. But they shall bring an offering to the Lord Friends, when you look back and see what the Lord has done in your life and what the Lord is doing in your life every day, there are those moments when you really look at yourself and you have nothing to offer. And the Bible is very clear. You are not going to offer what you do not have. You can only bring that which you have. If it is a 500 coin that is in your bag, that is what the Lord desires, that that is an offering and it will be pleasing to him. Think about the offering of the widow. 
that attracted the attention of Jesus. It was the smallest among those that had offered. But God looked at this widow and says the widow has given all that she had to live for. She gave it all for her. It is so sacrificial that she gave it all to the Lord. But the Lord is calling us and saying, when you come to my house, do not come empty handed. Come with something. Put something in the basket. Come, put something before the Lord. Friends, giving back to the Lord in church is kingdom business. It is only kingdom-minded people that will be able to give. If you are not kingdom-minded, it's going to be very difficult to give. I want you to look at your life and think about the so many people that have given for you. There's so many people that have stood out for you in the past. The time when you are so defeated and someone appeared in your life and was able to do something for you that you would not have done for yourselves. Some of us have gone through school, and some people have gone through school on scholarships. And the scholarship that you receive, you can never know who gave the money. It is someone who gave for kingdom purposes, and they will never know. Some of us have gone through compassion. And when you go through compassion, you receive this money, but you can never know who gave you the money. It is someone somewhere who really looked out and said, I'm going to save for an African somewhere. I visited a family in the U.S. and I found a young boy. He was at nine years by then. But he had a saving box and he was saving that when he comes to Uganda, he's going to pay fees for five students. And at 12, his parents brought him to Uganda. And I remember this boy, his name was called Christian. He arrived at Uganda Christian University. And he put his money for the scholarships for UCU students. A young boy of 12. He knew how to invest for kingdom. He did not want to know who is going to benefit from this money. But what he knew is that I need to give. And I need to give for someone's life. I have seen many, many people coming up and saying, God has given me a blessing and I have been educated by someone I do not know. You will never meet them to say thank you, but you can only come back to the Lord and say, God, thank you for what you have done. How do we give back to the Lord when the Lord has blessed us? Last week I was in Cambodia and I was blessed to meet this younger lady who has a bachelor's in education. In Cambodia, it's 93% traditional religion. And 7% is the religious denominations, Islam, Catholic, Anglican, and whatever added together, they make up 7%. Christianity is not pronounced. And so this young lady was educated in such a way that he, she, she, she found um, half space as, she, as the Christians encouraged them to go for games. And she found her space going for games. And when she went for games, as she played the games, they ministered to her and she gave her life to Christ. When she gave her life to Christ, she went back and shared that faith with her mother. So far, it is herself and her mother who know the love of Jesus. And this young lady, after finishing her Bachelor of Education, she realized that she needed to give back to the Lord. She didn't have the money to give back to the Lord, but they have started a school in which they can be able to slowly pass on the gospel. And this lady has offered to become a headmistress in that school where she does not even have a salary that is sounding, but she's giving up her life and her talent and her skill because someone did it for her. What is it that we are giving back to the Lord? Some of us could think it is only the money, but sometimes you do not have the money. Is there a skill that you're giving sacrificially to the Lord? Is there your, your life that you are saying for me, I have offered my life for the service of the Lord? Is it the time that you're saying I'm going to offer the time and give it all to the Lord and the Lord will bless you for the time that you have rendered for, her, for him? So may God give us the grace to seek his face and find out which ways can we be able to offer our lives and give back to the Lord. 
How can we be able to give back to the Lord? For the Jews, they were reminded, do not appear before the Lord empty handed. How do you appear before the Lord? What is it that you have handed over to the Lord? It begins with your life. Paul said that the Macedonians first gave themselves to the Lord before they gave their gifts to the Lord. And they gave their gifts exceedingly. Why? Because they had first given their hearts and lives to the Lord. Will you offer yourself to the Lord? That by offering yourself to the Lord, the Lord will touch everything that you have. And you'll grow up in such a mindset knowing that you own nothing. The Lord owns everything. As you come to seek the face of the Lord and say, God, I don't have a job. God, I need a job. God, I need a wife. God, I need a husband. You are seeking and you want the Lord to give it back to you. But ask yourself this question. What is it that you're giving back to the Lord? How is your relationship with the Lord? <clears throat> the children of Israel had a committed relationship with the Lord and they trusted the sovereignty of the Lord and they knew that they could do nothing without the Lord. Without God, it was very hard for them to transition from the promise from the land of Egypt into the promised land. Friends, giving is relational. It is intentional. It is a trust in God. It is depending on God to give you so that you can give back to him. It is trusting God with all your resources and being open to God and saying, God, this is actually what I have. And it is out of what I have that I'm giving back to you. The Lord does not require that which you do not have. The Lord requires that which you have that which you have touched, that which is yours. Be intentional, be consistent, give back to the Lord earnestly. And he says, verse 9, 17, he says, every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. Every person shall give according to how he is able to give. May God speak into our lives and into our hearts as we seek to be givers as we seek to please him, as we seek to surrender, the song says that count your blessings and you'll be surprised what the Lord has done. Sometimes it is a life of self-pity that stops us from giving back to the Lord. But just know that the Lord who has given you a little is the same God who is going to give you so much. And when you begin by learning to give back to the Lord, the Lord will grow you into someone that you have never thought to be. Let us pray. And as we pray, I just want to ask you to think about your own personal relationship with God. Because giving does not just begin from somewhere. It begins with you having a relationship with God. Just think about your relationship with God. You cannot give to the person whom you have no relationship with. When you read Acts chapter 2, you realize that people gave from everything. They sold their property and brought everything to the Lord. And they shared it together. They shared it together because they knew Jesus. Jesus had worked in their hearts. I pray to this afternoon that Jesus will work in your heart so that you can know that it all belongs to the Lord. Father, I give you all these, your sons and daughters that are listening to your word. My Father and my God, I pray that they will begin by giving themselves to you, Lord. And that, Lord, you'll give them the grace to make giving a priority. That they will sacrifice what they have for the business of the Lord. That my master, king of glory, they will give all that they are to you. And my master, king of glory, that they will not cheat you in a way of giving you the portion that belongs to you. Father, we give you praise. And we pray that through, uh, your, through our giving the work of mission will grow stronger. We give you thanks, Abba. Father, we worship you, for in Jesus Christ we have prayed. Amen, and God bless you. Um, wow. Uh, we thank the Lord for that message. May we be 